Hello and welcome to Speaking About Mental Health in the Retail Industry. My name is David Kopsch and I lead our retail industry practice at Mercer. We have a very special guest today, Mr. Peter Rudigliano, PhD. He's going to take us and learn from him about the mental health in the retail industry. Peter? Yeah, David, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about what are some of the concerns that employees are having in the retail space. Uh, I have 20 years experience in mental health, uh, and my practice has been doing this kind of work for quite some time. So let's dig into it. So we did this survey called Inside Employee Minds. Uh, we did it at the end of 2022, but we've done it for a couple of years now. And we found what was really interesting are some of these data that point out where mental health is as a concern for employees. And if you look down this list, we start with covering monthly expenses, workload, being able to retire, and then mental emotional health. This has become a real big concern. And what's interesting about this is it's been slowly bubbling up for years, but now since COVID, COVID has been a catalyst where really mental health has now opened wide up and there's a lot greater openness and a lot more opportunity to talk about it. So on the right-hand side, we let's talk a little bit about what are some of the mental health concerns that people are having. So mental health concerns would be any of the emotional states that people are dealing with. It's anxiety, it's depression, but there's more than that. It's the mental health concerns that I have at work. In other words, what's my workload like? What's the stress that I get from work? What about my ability to break away and detach from work? But then there's also the personal component, what's happening at home. Maybe I'm dealing with some anxiousness at home. Maybe I have a, a sick spouse, or maybe my children are going through something, or maybe I have some background mental health issues that I need to deal with on my own. Both of these components, both the personal and the work component, they cross over together and they impact people on a daily basis at work. Going into how do how have companies and how can companies go about identifying and meeting the needs of their people? Yeah, actually, you know what? That's a great question. Let's go on to the next slide. Historically, the way we used to deal with problems like this were through our employee assistance program. The employee assistance program, or EAP, was meant as sort of a triage. It was an opportunity to get people the help they need very quickly. It was primarily over the phone. There was a one-size-fits-all approach, and there was a bunch of different services. There could be lawyers involved. Let's say you had some financial problems. That could be held out. Maybe there's problems specifically around child care, or maybe you needed a counselor. The program was really designed to really help point people in the right direction, and that was really great, and it worked well for a long time. But in the last couple of years, we've seen this rise of what we're calling innovative EAP models. And what's interesting about these models is there was a couple of new services that they added. Number one, there was an app so we could evaluate how people are coming in, what's their level of anxiety or depression, and help really triage that person to figure out what is the triage the person and help them figure out what is the problem they need to get resolved and point them in the right direction. Previously, in the traditional, it was up to the employee to figure out where they needed to go. Now this new solution helps point people in the right direction. And there's a couple of different services. There's self-help that's available. There's online tools that they could look through and sort of figure out what their problems are and maybe figure it out on their own. There might be coaching, which is subclinical. Maybe I have some basic anxiety that's not really to the clinical level, or maybe I need a counselor. And all three of these were opportunities to make people well. The great thing about this was it provided an easier opportunity for people to transition into the program rather than going directly from never having therapy to actually going into a therapeutic relationship. Peter, it, it appears that it's about making it matter to me when it matters. Yes. So we went from I had to call to now the outreach is being made to me when I identify that I do have a problem or I need to get help or maybe just, am I okay? Are you okay, Peter? Right. So 
can organizations be targeted in that outreach? Yes, 100%. In fact, actually, one of the things that we started seeing with organizations is they were looking to help people during COVID. They had an EAP. It wasn't making the grade. In fact, if we go on to the next slide, what was happening was we were seeing there was a greater need for therapy that the EAP system at the time wasn't designed for. If you live in a desert, you don't worry about flooding. The same way, EAPs never had a huge uptake on a need for therapists. So we really struggled during that time. And what happened is organizations in trying to help out their employees said, you know what? There's different solutions out there. A point solution is a very targeted approach to fix a specific problem or issue. So for instance, it could be around uh, MSK or back pain. It could be around substance abuse. It could be around childcare issues. All of them are these individual solutions. And during COVID, we started adding all those solutions in. Now, that was great because all of these solutions are very, very targeted. So you know exactly what you're going to get out of it. And it really works well because they've been able to hone their skills around these specific solutions. The problem was it tends to get very expensive. And the bigger issue is if I'm dealing with someone who's in psychological distress, the worst thing that I could do is give them a lot of options. Because what happens is when someone's overwhelmed, the last thing they're going to want to do is have a lot of options because they're going to be overwhelmed. And the other problem sometimes we'll see is that these solutions sometimes aren't well integrated. So as an example, if I have a substance use, um, if I have a substance abuse point solution, is it integrated into my solution? Does the EAP know about that substance abuse solution? On top of that, if I'm working with the substance abuse point solution, and let's say a therapeutic issue comes up that they're not designed to deal with, do they know what and how to transition that person back into the ecosystem? So that's what presents as a problem in this solution. You know, Peter, so much we heard, we know in here in the retail industry is to your point about the overwhelm, this frontline workforce didn't stop working in COVID. And then they have the inflation. And then there, the, this customer anxiety or, or angst out in the marketplace, getting at the point solutions, how do we know what's going to resonate with our workforce? Let's go, though, to this next stage, which is around what are some of the barriers that get into, in the way of getting the treatment we need? The first one is always cost. Now, mental health programs tend to be a lot cheaper than medical health, that we know. But how are we getting those services to our employees? For most organizations, and this is really critical in the retail space, most of the time when people roll out a mental health solution, it's tacked on or added to their medical program. Well, if my employees aren't getting the medical program, they're also not getting the mental health program because the two of them are tied together. That's a very critical component, specifically within retail, that we have to think about. How else are we going to get them the care they need? Will the program be designed just for all employees or only people who choose to do it? A lot of times people don't choose to buy up for mental health. Like, oh, I don't need that. But when they really need it, they really need it, right? So that's really critical. Um, some organizations will do it through the back end, through their disability program, and sometimes they'll get it that way. But that's really critical. How are people getting access to us, and are they choosing to do it, or do we have it already there for them? The other one is around time and convenience. When I think about retail, here's a big concern. If, let's say, I had to go and see a therapist, well, all right, a therapy appointment's typically 50 minutes. Then I got to get in my car and drive to the therapy. Well, that takes a lot of time out of the day. How am I going to get there? When I was looking into going therapy for myself, it was going to take about two to two hours and 45 minutes out of my day between 
getting him leaving work getting in my car driving to the location waiting to see my therapist seeing the therapist getting back in the car getting back into my office i'm missing three hours of the day that's going to keep that is a huge barrier to people getting in there one of the reasons why virtual therapy has been so successful is because it cuts down the amount of time needed and it makes it easier to fit in but also thinking about retail, a lot of people that work in retail are working several jobs or they're trying to do a lot of overtime. And that's a real strong barrier. How am I able to get them help? One of the great things about some of these point solutions is because there's self-help, you could do it at any time of the day. There are apps that you could do while you're on the subway or on the bus coming home from work. That's a great convenience and it increases the likelihood that people will get into therapy. The other one is around ease of access. I had mentioned earlier to you, David, about um, going from not having therapy to having a therapeutic relationship. That's a big step. Well, this barrier to access could be resolved through baby steps. Let me go in and just do some self-help. Let me read up on some materials. Let me find out. Let me get used to what I think is going on and then do a coach. Sometimes seeing a coach is not as scary as seeing a counselor because it doesn't sound as bad for one reason or another. Now, granted, that's changing, and I'll talk about that in a second, but that's still a bit of a concern for some people, right? What is the person ready for? Uh, by the way, another ease of access when thinking specifically about retail is about diversity. When I was in graduate school, we didn't talk about what was the presenting race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation of the therapist. Now that's a critical part of the conversation. We have found that Black employees who see Black therapists have a much more successful outcome. The more we could match people to their therapists, the greater the likelihood of um, successful outcome. And then there's this last thing around stigma. Now, what's funny is the stigma of mental health was a real strong issue for many, many, many years. It's still a bit of an issue, but it's not nearly the way it used to be. Um, a lot more people see mental health as being a critical part of their journey and what they need to do to get better. It's a lot less of a problem. It's, it's larger in larger pop in, excuse me, older populations. You'll see there's a bigger concern. Uh, typically, um, Less education means there's more of a stigma, but it's slowly going away and people are getting a lot more used to it. We do find that younger populations, there's really a lot less of a stigma than there's ever been. So that's a lot less of a barrier uh, to access, but it's still sort of there. Peter, if I'm understanding everything correctly, we always tell people it's important that you exercise for your physical health. Should we understand that it's also important that we seek out these coaches, these counselors, these advisors, make the time, get understand there is a stigma, but it's important that they, they make the time, they go get the access, because that's also part of their exercise. Is that to get them mentally in a better place? Oh, without a doubt, 100%. You know, going to a physician doesn't mean there's necessarily something wrong with you, right? We've all been to a physician and that's a, just a perfect normal part of everyday life. A lot of times people are more afraid of going to a therapist, what they might find, what I might say or something like that. And the vast majority of people, once they start therapy, it's not really a problem at all. I remember I, I had one patient that I saw. She came to me when she was 45 years old. She had a specific problem called trichotillomania, which means she would pull her hair out. It's a fairly common affliction, but people are very, very embarrassed by it. After she and I spoke for a short amount of time, her hair started growing back and she was able to get a first haircut that she had had in 35 years. And I think to myself, if she had not been afraid to go to therapy, and we started dealing with it 30 years ago, she wouldn't have had to go through life that way. And it's it's a shame because it was about that stigma. It was about that fear. And to your point, it was about exercising those muscles. We have to work on our mental health very much the same way we have to work on our physical health. 
We also need guidance and tools to do that. Sometimes you could do it through self-help. Sometimes you need a little guidance from a coach and maybe sometimes you need a little bit more guidance from a counselor. But all of them will help right the ship and get you going in the right direction. And by the way, this doesn't mean it's a lifelong relationship. Usually the vast majority of mental health problems we could resolve in maybe eight to 12 sessions. It doesn't have to be a lifelong relationship. And then even after you've gone into therapy, it doesn't mean you're necessarily done. You can always go back in a year or two, right? It's exercising those muscles, you know, just the same way. I got to go back to the gym. Eh, maybe I need to go back to a therapist for a little bit, get some touch-up work, and then I can go back into the world. And I think, Peter, in, in the re retail industry, it's, it's always kind of been there. Yeah. I think you said it right. Is COVID accelerated to acknowledge it's very real? Yeah. We've got to address it, and we've got to help our people on the front lines and throughout the organization. Peter, resources. There's a lot going on here. Yep. Walk us through it. Yeah. So there's a number of different resources we have for employees. Um, and my goal in this is not, this isn't necessarily about what Mercer could do, but it's what's out there. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to hit upon the most of the ones on the left-hand side just real quick. So the first thing is leaders have to recognize the need for this. They have to recognize the importance in mental health support. This is really critical. There has to be an openness to it and this awareness to it. And talking about it openly does a lot to get rid of the stigma, but it also does a lot for employees to recognize, hey, my company cares about my mental well-being. And that in and of itself carries a lot of weight. And that's one of the things that you could work on. There's also this part about my EAP. So I've mentioned EAP before to you. A lot of organizations are coming to me and saying, P, our, our EAP program just isn't working. People are looking for therapists and they just didn't have any therapists available. So that's when I said, well, hold on a second. This happened right at the tail end of COVID when they needed so many more therapists than were even out in the United States at the time. Let's go back to your, let's go back to your EAP and say, hey, what else have you guys done? How have you improved your program? Have you added therapists? Or do you have coaching now? What kind of self-help tools? Talk to your traditional EAP about what other services they've added. And on top of that, what's the roadmap looking like going forward? If overall you've been pretty happy with them and you look at their roadmap and their roadmap's going to improve and move in the direction that you see a need for your organization, don't necessarily have to go to another one. But let's say your EAP just isn't working. You need to move faster than that. Or there are services your EAP doesn't have. You could do a full EAP RFP, which is we'll go out and investigate what is the best EAP program for your organization. In addition, I'm really stressing this. What about asking employees questions? We've done quite a number of different well-being surveys. They might be a well-being survey, maybe a mental health survey. We've also done safety surveys because that's another component of overall wellness. We've done diversity and inclusion survey, disability surveys. These are all different ways of figuring out what are the needs of your employees. I know a lot of people say, we need to fix this, but they don't know what this is yet. And they go in a direction and they might add point solutions or add services that your employees don't want or need, or maybe they don't have the time to use it. The other thing about this too is, remember at the very beginning, I said, mental health can come from work concerns or it can come from home concerns. Wouldn't it be nice to know that work is causing the mental health problems? And maybe that's the first place we should start to fix things. We've also looked into manager training. A lot of the research coming out now finds out those people who are most likely to stay mentally well have a good relationship with their manager and their manager is attuned to their wellness needs. That's a real critical component. So a lot of organizations now, they're doing a certain amount of mental health training. Now, the mental health training is not to make a manager a therapist. It's not to teach them all about anxiety and depression and suicide and stuff like that. The goal is more, I think of it as that light on the dashboard. You know that check engine light on the dashboard? The goal of that is to say, hey, something's wrong and say, get me fixed. That's the goal of a manager is to recognize when their employee has changed behaviors and you're like, 
you know what? Mary isn't acting the way she usually does. Let me check in with her. Let's see how she's doing. And let's see if she knows about the resources we have in our organization so that she could, you know, get the help that she needs. Uh, by the way, that right, Peter, we're not suggesting the manager has to be the best friend, right. but they at least have to be able to sense of, Peter, are you okay today? Is everything right. all right? And whether it be, look, I've got a lot built up at work. And then they're taking that home because, Peter, what do we spend? Eight, 10 hours a day at right. work and with our work people? We're right. going to take it home. <laughs> We're going to take home yeah. into the workplace. Right. It's just a simple matter of we can survey them or just check in and have a conversation. Peter, yeah. are you okay? A hundred percent. And the other part about this also is I recognize as a therapist that how we treat people at work to a certain extent is a model of how we're treating people at home. If I'm being short with my coworkers, more than likely I'm being short with my spouse. And it's incredible how making them aware of this not only helps their working relationship, but very frequently also helps their home relationship. And that's incredibly rewarding. The last piece, let me just hit on this last piece real quickly about improving quality and return on investment. A real big move that's happening in the mental health space and also in the medical space is we're collecting all of these data around what are our mental health needs and also what are our physical health needs. And looking at the data and finding out what solutions are we using that give us the most bang for our buck. I love the fact now that we're starting to look at saying, does this program work? Did it reach the outcomes we say it is? I've mentioned earlier that if we have a really strong mental health program, it should decrease absenteeism. It should increase productivity at work. It should decrease safety problems. It should decrease medical claims. Well, if that's true, prove it. And that's one of these aspects that I'm really excited about. We're now building dash database dashboards where we're looking in, at the trends and what's going on and seeing how well is it working. It reminds me, Peter, so much of outcome-based care yep. and care that really makes a difference in people's lives and not simply a go see a therapist is actually it's action oriented, it's care focused on the needs of the people. Agreed, 100%. So Peter, wrapping us up. Yeah, yeah. So the biggest problem I've been seeing in most organizations, specifically looking at the HR department, because that's really where most of our uh, attention is right here, is that the different departments of the organization and even within departments, they're not talking to each other. So as a perfect example, I'll work with an organization about their EAP benefits and I'll ask them, hey, what does your employee survey say around things like stress and workload and wellness? And frequently the answer is, you know, I, I don't know that. I said, well, before we implement something, let's see what's going on with the employees. And on top of that, if we are measuring it through the employee survey, which happens in our talent management department, maybe there's a way we could track and show that we're having an impact on people. Additionally, we're not connecting the technology together. There's great data in talent management. There's great absentee data in there. There's other metrics that we have in our organization, like safety data and incidents. Why don't we tie all these together and figure out what's going on with our employees and how can we best help them become the best employee that we can make? I know that people who really enjoy their job and enjoy their work typically have happier, healthier lives. And that's where I see us moving with this. If we create a better program for employers, we'll make happier, more productive, healthier people in the end. Peter, if I'm reading you and hearing you, sir, it's human resources facilitates through technology. They had identify the root cause, the problems using the technology to address the benefits that matter for the business, that yep. leave management, that program diversity, yep. and ultimately 
better solving for these what are, what are determined these current broken links in behavioral programs. What are your final thoughts to how organizations go forward from here? Yeah, I, the first part I would want them to do is take a step back and think about what are we doing for our employees from a mental health perspective and think about all of the different aspects of it. What kind of manager training do we have? What kind of benefits do we have? What are specifically our mental health benefits? What are the services like? Mapping all of that out and then paying attention to what is the end result we want to get to? And then putting that all together to create a program that says this will make things and move things forward. Right now, we're just starting on this journey. It's the first time organizations are coming to me on a regular basis saying, hey, we're concerned about the mental health of our employees. What can we do to make things better? And more importantly, knitting it all together. We all have to beat to the same drum on this. And that's really the critical part. Thank you for listening to us. You can find more details about mental health, overall benefits at mercer.com for more materials and great speakers like Peter Rotugliano, PhD on mental health. Thank you for joining us.